Hello and welcome to a short half hour presentation on some risk analysis modeling aspects uh, pertinent to Basel 2 or as it will be known shortly in Basel 3. My name is David Vos, I'm the director of Vos Software, um, who are the makers of Model Risk, and I'm giving this presentation. So what was Basel II? Um, well, the purpose of Basel II, uh, published in 2004, was to set uh, rules that would ensure that banks have sufficient capital to cover their risks. Um, in recent years, we've obviously figured out that um, that didn't work. But, uh, the idea was that the same rule would essentially apply for all banks internationally if it was uh, globally adopted. So that you wouldn't have uh, some competitive advantage by a bank that, um, that held in reserve insufficient, reserve insufficient capital to cover its risks. It wasn't widely implemented until the banking crisis, uh, but now countries use it a lot more, or they apply individually more stringent rules in the United States, for example. It's uh, Basel II is now effectively superseded by Basel III, but the modeling that I'm going to be talking about still applies. So it's the idea is to uh, try and ensure that banks have sufficient capital. And so what does that mean? A bank cannot hold sufficient reserves to cover all 100% of its risks. That's an impractical uh, solution. So therefore we need to have a level of confidence or probability that they do have a sufficient capital in reserve. And when we talk about probability, we have to start talking about quantifying and trying to figure out the probability that they will have enough money in the bank. And this is, of course, where risk modeling comes in. There are three pillars uh, to Basel II. One is the calculation of the capital that would be required. Uh, the second pillar is the regulatory response, um, which is the supervision to pillar one. Um, that includes uh, evaluating the models that a bank will produce in order to uh, estimate its capital reserve requirement, um, plus evaluation of other non-quantified risks, um, which are called residual risks, things like market risk and uh, pension risk, etc. And then the third, clap, uh, third pillar is the disclosure requirements uh, in, to make sure that a bank is uh, being open and honest about the risks that it takes and that everybody gets to know that. There are three areas of risk in pillar one uh, that are used, that are evaluated. And these are credit risk and uh, operational risk and market risk. In credit risk, uh, there are different options that one may choose in pillar one. a standardized version, foundation, and the advanced interest rate-based uh, method. And we're going to be look at the advanced interest rate-based method a little. Operational risk. Um, operational is, the again, three different methods. A basic indicator idea, there's a uh, uh, standardized method and advanced measurement. And we're going to be looking at advanced measurement. And then there's market risk, which is used as a value at risk approach. All right, so uh, let's look at those three elements a bit more. Credit risk. Um, the credit risk is about the risk of direct loans or bonds um, that a bank, uh, a bank holds. Uh, on payback. And the method, the quantitative method of interest here, because we're dealing with quantitative modeling, is something called the advanced interest ratings based approach. Now, the, the key to this is that, as with the other aspects of quantitative modeling, is that the banks can develop their own model uh, subject to regulatory approval. So they, they must have the assumptions and the mass uh, underpinning their models um, validated or accepted by. Uh, banking regulator in the country. And the basic principle is that they calculate a risk-weighted asset, which is a function of the probability default, the exposure given default, and the loss given default. And then uh, from that certain calculation, 
there is a fixed percentage of the uh, risk weighted asset which is set as the required capital. Um, there are lots of models that we could look at um, and I'm just going to give two very simple models. Simple because I'm more interested in stimulating you into thinking about the ideas that you can use model risk for uh, and, and risk modeling um, and not get too involved in the, the details of the model. So the first model I want to look at is a Markov chain example for the number of losses. Now, I appreciate that's only a component of the whole calculation, essentially the probability default component. But let's look at that very quickly. So here's a very simple model. Uh, it's got a matrix here which is called a transition matrix in a Markov chain process. So the, the way you read this is here we've got three different uh, credit rating categories. I appreciate there are many more, but um, we don't really need to look at them from the point of view of, uh, of defaults. Defaults being when the loan doesn't get paid back. You've got credit rating A and B and then the default. And you read this as the probability of going from, say, A to each one of these different states. So you'll see that this is this contains all possible states. It's either A or B or default. And you'll see that these probabilities, therefore, add up to 100%. You can see that in the bottom of my screen here. So if a, uh, let's say, uh, a company in which you um, have lent some money, if uh, it is in currently a credit rating A, what is the probability that it will default within a certain time period? And in this case, we can see the probability is 1%. If there be, the probability is 6%. And of course, if default, then well, we can argue about whether they could come in and out of uh, protected receivership. Um, but essentially, for this modeling purposes, we've left it at 100%. This is called an absorption state. An absorption state means that once uh, uh, an entity entering this process, it ends up in default, it never leaves it. If there is no probability of it going from default to any of the other states. Now, this is a credit rating uh, transition matrix for one year. And you'll find that uh, a company credit rating agencies like Standards & Poor's and Moody's and Filch, they, uh, it, they um, produce these matrices. And they do it by looking at companies that have these different uh, credit ratings um, based on a set of rules. And then the fraction of those companies with that particular credit rating, like AA1, the fraction that then move into each of the uh, higher and lower um, credit ratings. So this is a matrix for one year. Now, if I was to say, uh, I've actually got a number of different uh, loans out, 120 loans to a uh, companies with a, an A rating. I've got 77 loans to companies with a B rating, and we're going to ignore any companies I might have any loans to defaulting companies. They're already lost. Now, what I'd like to know is if we move forward a certain amount of time, how, much, how many will I have in each of these different states? Actually, what I'd really like to know is how many of them are going to be defaulting. So uh, if this was a year, you can see what's happening here, I'm hitting the F9 key. And as I hit the F9 key, the numbers change. Let's have a look at the formula that's being used here. It will say C equals those Markov sample, and it has these as inputs. It has the number of assets I have in each of those states, A, B, and default. It has the probability transition matrix, and then it has the number of periods I'm looking forward. So if this is a, a data probabilities based on yearly transition, 
then looking forward one year, I get what it looks like this. Now, if uh, we were to look at two periods into the future, this is a matrix applied to one period, if you look at two periods, then essentially this is a repetition of the same process two times. So you would have how many individuals that went from their starting state to a different state in the middle, and then how many of those entered into each of the other states, and so we end up with a matrix like this. This is a, quite a simple uh, problem to do, and it's just, uh, you can do this fairly easily by using uh, matrix multiplication, in fact. If you multiply this matrix by itself, then that will be the probability matrix for a two-year period. But where model risk is a bit different is that we have a slightly fancy tool in that we can, for example, take fractions of years. So on the one, case, on the one hand, you may have data for a single year, but you're not actually interested in only a year from now. You might be interested in half a year or might be interested in one month. Now, as long as this uh, matrix is something called positive semi-definite, so what we can do is we can take fractional, um, it, in fact it is true, but uh, it has to be, the root of it has to be uh, semi-definite, but that's not something we're worrying about. Okay, so back on track. Um, we, can, we can look at half a year, and what, in order to be able to figure out half a year, you need to find the matrix, if you like, which, when multiplied by itself, would be equal to this matrix here. So that's uh, not that easy um, to find the square root, but there are, um, there are techniques for doing it. So what I want to point out here is that if you have this matrix for being different states and the default, um, then you can very quickly simulate how many individuals you might have in the default state after a certain period. And of course, as I was, if I increase this to a number of years, say to 10, then you'd expect that because it's an absorption state, once you're in that state, you can never get out, then the number is higher. So here it's around 50, 60. Um, but if I, say, put in half a year, then it's going to be around 1 to 5. Something. Right, so a simple model. And just to remind you, any of you who have already uh, been on any of our webinars, uh, if you've registered for a webinar, you can always get a copy of this, um, of these models you in fact send them. Um, I should just point out that we've made this very simple, but the transition probabilities don't necessarily have to come from historic information um, directly. They can also um, be functions of other things. Um, they might be functions of the interest rates or uh, GDP growth or and a bunch of different factors that perhaps uh, change the probabilities. You can imagine if you're in last year, perhaps we got this data from last year and our economy was great, and this year our economy is take, taking a turn for the worse. Well, you'd expect the probabilities of reducing your credit rating, if you like, or the probabilities of default to go up. So uh, a more complex model will, will have done some logistic regression type things to figure out what these probabilities are. Okay, a second model I want to show you is, imagine you have a large number of small loans. So here I have a model where this is a distribution that I might have many, many loans. In this case, I've got 5,384 different loans out there. There's a distribution attached to each one of these loans. So, and we don't know, we have no idea which ones of these will default. Um, and normally when, when somebody defaults on a loan to a bank, then they, uh, they'll sell your grand grandmother if they can to be able to recover some money from that. So there is a fraction loss. So it isn't necessarily the entire uh, loan that is being lost. And here we have number of obligers. Uh, so I've got the exposure distribution. This is the size of a loan. The loss fraction, which is a beta distribution. Um, if, you, if you function the beta distribution, you'll see that it's a variable, in fact, goes from 0 to 1, but it's concentrated a lot around a 10 to 40 percent, with a peak somewhere around about 22 percent. So that's an appropriate distribution to describe a fraction. Uh, then we have the uh, probability of default. We may have got that from somewhere else. 
what do we think probability that any one of those individual loans uh, will default really is? And then that brings us to uh, the, an estimate of the number of defaults we might get. Well, number of defaults is equal to a binomial distribution, if we consider all of these uh, obliges to be independent of each other. Um, binomial distribution with this number of trials, and this is the probability of success. And when I hit the F90 again, you'll see that that number is changing. But it's sitting around somewhere around 110, 120. And finally, down here, uh, a function that um, you may not be familiar with, if you, even if you are familiar with model risk, is uh, those sum product. What does that mean? Well, it's taking the sum of, in this case, 146 different uh, calls from a product of this log normal distribution and this theta distribution. So let's think what that means. It means that we're taking uh, one individual, the first individual default, and we're saying it's some, uh, the total loan is somewhere within that log normal distribution. Pick a random sample from that log normal distribution. And then pick a random sample of the fraction of loss that you would get. Multiply the two together. Repeat that 146 times in this case, and you'll get whatever number is appearing in this cell. So it's a multiplication of this random variable by this one, added up 146 times. And that is the reason why, in this model, we've got a log normal object, because I'm calling a sample from that distribution many times. In this case, 146 times, but in the next time scenario, it's 110 times, etc., etc. And that's why this is also a beta distribution object. Okay. So that was our second model. The second uh, type of risk for uh, the Pillar 1 uh, models is called operational risk. So operational risk are the internal risks of a bank that cause losses to them. And there are many different categories of risk, um, fraud, for example, uh, outsourcing to another company, um, processing of uh, transactions. Um, few, there are many different uh, types of operational risk. And the total exposure that you have so the distribution of losses that you might have is the aggregate sum of these different categories. So you could have the number of events, uh, the number of fraud uh, events that occur, the number of outsourcing events, etc. And then you have the distribution of loss that might occur for each event. So, for example, you could have three frauds in a year, um, and one might cost you $10,000, another one costs you $100,000, another one costs you a $1 million. You know, there are, there's a, a distribution describing what the size of that loss might be for that particular type, category of, uh, of operation risk. There's also a slight issue in the loss events uh, within a bank are not reported below some threshold because you don't, there will be very many uh, very small mistakes that people make and we, we clearly can't write down, document every single little tiny mistake that somebody makes. Uh, but we can correct for that to some degree. So I have a little model here it's called operational risk loss model. And I'm going to show you a few things in here, um, which are a little bit of math to, to, to make it a bit more interesting. Again. Right, so the data I have here, uh, or I started recording information on operational losses in, on the 1st of January 2007. And I finished uh, uh, recording information, so that's the latest information perhaps, on uh, the 5th of November, that's today. 5th of November 2012. So that's a total of uh, 5.85 years. In, within my bank, the minimum uh, cost would be, uh, that you would observe, is 10,000 euros, because below that value, we don't require that anybody uh, documents the, the loss. And if you don't require it to be documented, it's not going to be documented. No one's going to tell you about it. 
because people don't like to admit that they made a, made a mistake. So uh, to make life a little bit simple, um, I've got all of these data here of different types of operational loss. Um, these come from a particular financial institute that uh, we've done work for, adapted a little bit. And you can see here that I've fitted a probability distribution to those data sets. This one I fitted a log normal distribution. And if you saw the previous seminar that we gave last week on extremes, we could have fitted several different types of distribution and found out which one was the best fitting and used that. You can see that this is a log normal fit object because I'm going to do stuff with this fitted log normal distribution. So I'm not just going to sample from it one time. Uh, it's picking data and it's also picking up here on the threshold. So the threshold of 10,000. And so we have, when we're fitting the data, we've got a little extra parameter in here. Those trunk dated, truncated data, um, and it's truncated on this value here reporting threshold. So the minimum observed is anything as a reporting threshold, we've never seen anything below it. We could have also put in the maximum, but we don't see it. So here's my biggest data set. I'm just going to few function that. You can see time put on. Okay, you can see this one there. So here's the fitted distribution um, and there's some stuff missing because I don't have the absolute minimum value. All right, so I've got a bunch of different distributions here, log normal distributions, uh, fitted to each of these uh, data sets. And then I, I'm trying to figure out how many, um, how many of these operational loss I might have in the next year. So here we have the number of counts. This is I'm just counting that data set, which uh, has occurred in the last 5.85 years, um, then I'm looking at the probability that I will get a value greater than 10,000. Um, 10,000 being my threshold. 1 minus the probability of being less than 10,000 is the probability of exceeding it. So I'm looking at the probability that this log normal distribution here is uh, less than 10,000. And here, the expected frequency, the average number of events I get, well, that's going to be 7 divided by 5.85 years. But I'm also going to divide by this probability because I want to raise the probability a little bit to take into account the fact that some of those actual operational losses, they didn't really uh, get uh, marked down, so they're not in my data set. So this is, the combination of these things has managed to uh, count to, to uh, correct for the fact that I have these losses that are unobserved by assuming that we've got a log normal distribution. Right, then I can put this all together and say, right, the total uh, uh, loss that we might expect in the next year is, in this case, an aggregate MC, a Poisson distribution, so both Poisson, with this expected frequency. So the expected frequency, which is effectively, on average, how many uh, uh, risks of that category I observed in that year, corrected for the fact that we had quite a few unobserved So that's the Poisson distribution. Poisson is used to uh, reflect a count of uh, risk events that may occur where they're independent and there's no memory. In other words, that there is the same probability with each moment of time the risk will occur. So that's the first component. I'm adding this number of uh, operational risks together. And each one of them costs me, and here we have the second uh, variable, which is the fitted log normal distribution. So that's the size of one individual uh, risk, a little like the, the previous problem. So what this is doing is it's taking, in this case, zero, you'll see there. Um, it, the Poisson distribution came up with a value of zero, that can happen. And so it's having no risks. But if I hit the F9 key, and you'll see these numbers change. So each of these cells represents the total aggregate uh, cost that you might have from each of these different categories of operational risk, and all I need to do is add it all up together at the bottom to give me the total estimate. In fact, there are some other more sophisticated techniques um, that 
people uh, may, may like to use. Um, for example, uh, we find that sometimes people uh, in banks, insurance companies, they say, we've got these aggregate risks here, that's all fine, but we want them to be correlated in some way. So we want the, the chances of a higher risk, uh, or a higher total cost for a fraud um, to, to occur at the same time as a higher um, for a processing or outsourcing. And it just gives a way of tweaking it a little bit to try and overestimate the risk. In that case, you would want to use um, something called the fast Fourier transform method, which you can find in our aggregate menu here. You've got fast Fourier transform. And with fast Fourier transforms, it approaches things a little bit differently. You would have a Poisson, for example, um, um, number of losses. You had a log normal, for example. It could be any type of distribution, um, continuous distribution log normal distribution for the size of an individual loss, but the aggregate fast forward transform, what it does is it uses a special mathematical technique to figure out what that distribution is exactly. So it does it in a numerical way, uh, and it means that we can sample directly from that distribution. And if we can sample directly from this distribution, not simulate internally with loops and give the total at the end, but actually sample directly, it means that we can uh, correlate this random variable using the copula structures that we have in model risk um, with other aggregate distribution. The third type of uh, model um, uh, or third type of risk that is modeled within the Basel II framework is called market risk. This is the risk of losses that a bank may take in positions that it takes in the market. For example, um, positions it might have in equity or interest rates, um, all the different hedging, etc., currency, commodities. Uh, usually, well, people use something called a value at risk, VAR. The value at risk is the loss below some probability threshold. So if you were to say, um, what is expected loss um, in the bottom 10 percentile of my loss distribution? then it would, or what is the loss? What is the tenth percentile? Um, that's the value at risk. It's commonly used, but actually it's not the best measure of risk or tail risk. A much better one is something called CVAR, or a conditional value at risk, uh, sometimes also called expected shortfall. Uh, this is also available in model risk. You can, it requires you to produce a simulation and what this essentially does is it looks, instead of um, the 10th percentile, for example, it will look at the mean of that tail from the 0th to the 10th percentile in terms of revenue, so the loss tail. What is the average loss, given that you are uh, below the 10th percentile, how much would you on average be losing? This is uh, it, it's much more consistent with a, a number of uh, financial uh, theory, um, uh, financial concepts, and um, it's gradually getting uh, more and more popular, and it's directly available. We have a function called var, for example, that will directly figure this out for you. And you can set the percentile or value against which you want to um, pick the tail. Market risk, um, because it is looking at variables like equity and interest rates and currencies, you can imagine that these are random variables that uh, continuously changing over time. And there are uh, an awful lot of very complex models that are used in to, to try to make these sorts of stochastic projections. Um, we have many of them within model risk, um, from arch and garch and aparch and egarch to simple, simple autoaggressive moving average. And it, individual variables um, will maybe better uh, uh, be represented by different types of models depending on the, the structure of the volatility and that they have over time. Traditionally, these models are based on normal variations of the ubiquitous normal or Gaussian distribution or bell-shaped curve. And uh, correlations between variables are uh, traditionally modeled using the normal copula. Uh, now, uh, they tend to underestimate the tails, and we've seen uh, 
the effect of that with the banking crisis where tails have been grossly underestimated. And if you ever read uh, Taleb's books, or The Black Swan, or listened to Paul Wilmot going on about, um, about what, how quants do their modeling, there was uh, a general agreement, though uh, um, unfortunately not a, a, a general change of practice, that these normal distributions and normal copulas really aren't a very good method. It was kind of a safety in numbers. If everybody, if everybody used the same type of assumptions, then we all pretty much price the, the commodities or the options or whatever um, about the same. And um, if, we, if one of us falls, we all fall. Well, they all fell. Um, model risk uh, has some many more precise tools to uh, get around this normal uh, distribution and normal copula. Um, we have, instead of the normal distribution, you can use something called the generalized error distribution, or GED. Uh, you can use the skew normal, the normal mix, the Cauchy, the Laplace, Levy, etc. That we have a number of them. In other words, within model risk, uh, you are not restricted to making that normal distribution assumption. And if you have historic data on returns, you can fit all these various different distributions, and you can see how they can compare, and you can determine the distribution that most satisfies um, the data, which matches the data. We also have a number of different copulas um, within model, model risk. Uh, instead of just that normal copula, which you will find in, in all the other tools that do perform risk analysis in Excel, we also have the Clayton, Frank, and Gumbel. Um, these are called uh, elliptical copulas. No, sorry, they're not. They're called Archimedean copulas. And they have, they give you the ability to show that the correlation structure could be, for example, much stronger and have a much higher level of correlation when the variables are really stressed, when they're really at their low values. And that's precisely the sort of situation we've already found ourselves in recently. Um, we also have the T copula, which is a little bit like the normal copula, but has a bit of extra flexibility. Uh, and that's used quite a lot in the financial markets now. And finally, we have the empirical copula, something um, that you won't find in any other software tool. The empirical copula, it statistically interprets historical data. And it doesn't try to fit historical data to any particular pattern. It simply tries to statistically replicate that pattern. And in my view, uh, although you pay something of a penalty in that the simulations run significantly slower because it's much more uh, simulation intensive, you are much more guaranteed to have a result that is really as close as possible to data your history, if indeed you believe that history to apply to the future. So, uh, a brief uh, review of Basel 2 stroke 3. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. We will send you by email uh, a copy of the models and the PowerPoint slideshow uh, that I've just shown you. Uh, we'll also give you a link uh, to an, a much edited version of this um, of this particular talk, which will get rid of um, my mistakes. Um, if you have any questions, you're very welcome to send me an email directly uh, to david at flowsoftware.com. Um, you can visit our website, flowsoftware.com, and you can give us a call in our Belgium office here um, on this number. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>